Uh, good evening. All right. Well, that was quite an introduction. That was not something I expected. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, I'd like to plunge right into tonight's talk. Uh, it's rare that a reporter gets to follow one story for a period not consistently, but over a 27-year um, period, um, going in and out, other assignments, coming back to um, look for other look for answers to um, the questions of intergenerational poverty and um, the results of, of racism in the United States, um, the, your editors will, will get tired of letting you go back and forth constantly writing about the same thing. But I was able to do it over a 27 year period. Um, and, and I'm happy I was because for myself it provided some insights and understandings about uh, about both interracial, interracial, intergenerational poverty and the results of racism in America. At any rate, the first foray I took into this was with a colleague, a man named Ben Bakdikian, who is a um, nationally known um, newspaper critic. Um, he's now retired, retired from the University of California, Berkeley School of Journalism. Um, he and I, in 1971, um, embarked on a project on looking at prisons in the United States. And I just didn't want to look at prisons. I wanted to look at um, this aspect that prisons talk about, at least um, forward-looking prisons, the aspect of rehabilitation. And um, during my initial stages of looking at the D.C. prison system, I found several groups of family members locked up in the same prison of different generations. Um, and I approached several of them, but they, not all of them were interested in talking to me about their lives of crime. They were all criminal recidivists. They'd been going in and out of prison since they were teenagers, and they now are all adult men. The oldest man in, among the men that I approached was in his 70s. But two men, father and son, Lawrence Smith Sr. and Lawrence Smith Jr. did come into my project, and I interviewed them over several months, trying to understand how a father and son can literally end up in the same prison. Um, and initially, the interviews uh, they gave um, very curt um, answers, and I just stayed with them over a three-month period, in and out. I didn't, I didn't move into the prison. <laughs> Let me be clear on that. But I was in and out of the prison, the D.C. prison. It's called the Central Prison, um, on a regular basis, interviewing them and doing tape-recorded interviews and then listening to the tapes and hoping to get to a period where the, the nuances of what they were telling me would begin to change. And they did over time. as. Um, as they began to trust me, really, is what the, I mean, I was a total outsider in their world. Um, and at the end of three months, one of my major contributions to the series, which was later put into a book called The Shame of the Prisons, um, was that these two men demonstrated that in terms of growing up in poverty in Washington, D.C., they had never been given a, a basic academic education um, and that um, criminal activity, petty criminal activity, they were not involved in any violent crime. Petty criminal activity was uh, a major source of income for them and would always be because the prison system, as much as it said it was there to rehabilitate people, um, could not provide these two men, Lawrence Smith at that time, senior, was 55, and his son was 30, could not provide these men with even the basic tools to be competitive in the American job market. And that's been a consistent theme of my reporting and the things that I have found over, over a number of years. 
Um, anyway, um, after that was published, then uh, I was off to Africa and uh, covering guerrillas fighting first against the Portuguese in Angola, and then went back to live with the guerrillas again when the Civil War broke out in Angola. And I was able to um, do what has become part of the methodology that I use today. I lived with these guerrillas for seven and a half months, covered 2,100 miles through a war zone, um, but always traveled with the same band of bodyguards and guerrillas. I had a bodyguard of about 50 guerrillas um, that stayed with me the whole seven and a half months. And I did repeated interviews with them. What I, what I was looking for was what would motivate, because I was traveling with whole family units, what would motivate men and women traveling with their children to go on and fight this sort of endless guerrilla war in the forest of um, the central Angolan plateau. Um, and at the end, um, well, at this point, Angola was a big issue in the um, American press, and it was talked of these groups that were fighting the Civil War were talked about in Cold War terms, um, that one group was pro-Western and the other group was pro-Soviet. And that's not what I found, that the genuine motivations for these guerrillas to fight one another was really basic ethnic fear of each other, the same kind of thing you see today in Iraq, um, had nothing to do with the Cold War or the perspective of being pro-Soviet or pro-Western, they would verbalize um, uh, the ideology in order to get money and arms. That <laughs> was their whole motivation. But they would fight each other as to who would eventually come to dominate uh, Angola or rule Angola. The war finally ended. Um, it started in 75 and it ended in February 2002 when the government was able to kill the guerrilla leader, Jonas Savimbi, trapping him in the forest. And his movement then collapsed around him. And Angola is trying to recover from um, her, what was a horrific, as all civil wars are, horrific, horrific civil war. Then back to the States for a while, and then back to Africa for five years as an African correspondent. Um, traveling 80% of the time, um, covering everything that moved, lots of um, activity and lots of things to cover. And I returned to the States in January of 84. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd been assigned as an assistant foreign editor on the foreign desk, but the, all that meant was that you edited other correspondents' copy as the stories came in, and I wasn't interested in doing that. But a friend of mine gave me a clue on how I could maneuver to get out of that assignment. Um, and she told me in a casual conversation that, this is in January of 1984, that 53% of all black children born in 1983 were the children of single mothers. That figure today is now 65%. And that over a third of those single mothers were adolescent girls growing up in urban poverty. <clears throat> and I said to myself, well, I said to her that her figures were wrong. They were much too high. I'd been out of the country for five years, but there was no way that um, adolescent childbearing among poor black adolescent girls could be so high. And so we bet a, a dinner at a very expensive restaurant in Washington called Reeve Goach. And I had, to buy the, I had to buy the dinner. She was right, I was wrong. Um, I first went to find out the accuracy of the figures and the projected climb of those figures. I first went out to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, to the um, Child Development Center and talked to a demographer named Wendy Baldwin. And she told me that my friend's figures were right. In fact, the figures were were really skyrocketing at this point in 84. And um, so I went back to the post and maneuvered around and um, got moved from the foreign desk to the investigative desk, uh, headed by Bob, Bob Woodward, to do a project on adolescent childbearing. Um, 
one of the first things that I did um, when I began to look into this is I began talking to people, um, white and black, friends and relatives, asking them why they thought so many black adolescent girls were having babies at such high rates. And um, there were a lot of glib responses, none of which satisfied me, but some people said, well, they thought the girls were emotionally needy and easily taken advantage of by the macho boys, teenage boys that lived in their communities. And I, my response was, well, I grew up in Harlem and I didn't find a lot of emotionally manipulative girls, girls that you could easily manipulate when I was a teenage boy in Harlem. So <clears throat> where were all these girls um, when I was growing up? When you looked at it, <laughs> when you looked at it realistically, um, girls, I felt, um, in my community, and probably this is probably a universal aspect of the gender differences. Girls mature much earlier than boys. And, and the girls in my community became bored with us very quickly, the other boys that they had grown up with. And they were generally interested in older boys, boys going to college and so on, and while we were still in high school. And we were still awkward and goofy. Um, and um, I didn't see where Given that difference, these girls would be easily manipulated. Other people told me that the girls were having um, babies to have someone to love in their otherwise bleak lives. And I thought maybe there was some truth in that, but it turned out later that that was not true either. Uh, I presumed incorrectly that the girls were having babies out of ignorance of birth control if they were sexually active or ignorant about their body's abilities to reproduce children, and the same ignorance would be on the part of the boys. And I was wrong on all counts, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, a cousin of mine, who is a retired principal uh, from Fairfax County in Virginia, right outside of Washington, <clears throat> she said to me, um, well, I think the girls in her school serviced a very poor area of Fairfax County, an enclave of descendants of freed slaves called Gum Springs. And that, that community is still there, still mired in poverty today. Um, and she said, well, I believe that the girls are having babies to qualify for welfare payments. And I said, well, no, that's, that's not accurate. I've already followed enough welfare families to know that there is generally, with the welfare stipend, there generally is no food in the house by the third or fourth week of any month. I don't see why, I don't see how that is some great incentive, to, financial incentive to have children. Um, so we agreed to disagree, to disagree. But um, after a while, I began to collect data on every census tract in the city of Washington. And I looked at those census tracts for the highest rates of adolescent childbearing in the city. And the, the community that had the highest rate of adolescent childbearing was, is a community called Washington Highlands on the, city's, on the edge of the city's border with the state of Maryland. Um, and predictably, 26% of its 19,000 residents were living at or below levels of poverty. And so that was the community that I decided to move into in the summer of 1984. And I lived there for a year. My neighbors at first greeted me with a lot of skepticism that I was indeed a Washington Post reporter who had moved into one of the, most, one of the poorest and most dangerous communities in Washington to look at adolescent childbearing. Adolescent girls, uh, pregnant adolescent girls, and um, teenage mothers were an unremarkable sight in Washington Highlands. So people questioned why all of a sudden would a middle class reporter move into this community to look at it. A man who later turned out to be one of my best informants, Charles Willie Hood, um, threatened me at first um, um, because he thought I really was an undercover cop 
looking at the community's pervasive drug traffic. But over time, he, he came to believe that I was an eccentric reporter. Who, um, and he became one of my best informants about attitudes that I really hadn't known existed. Uh, in the summer of 1984, we did a lot of walking around Washington Highland, and he showed me the areas that he had grown up in. He was 19 at the time. And he eventually introduced me to uh, a girl who, when he was 16, they, had, they, they were dating. She was 15, and she, um, they were sexually active, and she became pregnant. Um, and so we were talking about this, and he said that she later told him, after she told him that she was pregnant, that she was going to have an abortion. And he threatened her. He threatened really to harm her physically if she had an abortion. And uh, he told her, don't you let anything happen to that baby. Well, she went ahead and secretly had an abortion anyway. And that ended their relationship. Um, as teenagers tend to do, they did come back together and dated again, and they were, became sexually active again. But he became, a, he became aware shortly after they had um, um, reenacted their relationship that um, there was no pregnancy or fear of pregnancy on her part. And so he asked her, and she found out, he found out that she was taking birth control pills. And that, for him, ended the relationship. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, with her taking that pill, I couldn't feel like a man. She couldn't get pregnant. Uh, and that, to me, was the first clue of what I was going to find in Washington Highlands. There's nothing that I had anticipated or suspected. Um, one of the first teenagers that I interviewed was a young woman named Tasha Vaughn. And I interviewed her in her parents' living room over the coffee table. And um, a good half hour into the conversation, she leaned, this is a 16-year-old girl. She had just turned 16 that previous June. And this is September of 1984. She leaned across the coffee table. And she said to me, Mr. Dash, would you stop asking me about birth control pills? Girls out here know about every form of birth control. What you need to understand is that girls out here get pregnant because they want to have a baby. Again, um, a revelation for me. Um, shortly after the interview with Tasha, I interviewed Lottie Marie Bucci Williams. And she said to me, well, over the 45 minute interview, she was um, 16 and had a daughter who was 18 months old. And she was very evasive in responding to the questions that I had. And my questions were open but very explicit about what she understood about sexuality and did she understand this before she became pregnant with her daughter. And she was very vague in her responses. So I finally just turned the tape recorder off and I said, um, Lottie, you know, you really haven't been candid with me, have you, in your responses to how you became a mother at 14? And she said, no. She said that she had given me the answers that she thought would satisfy a nosy high school counselor. And I said, oh, boy. <laughs> that's the, that, that's the, uh, that is, those are not the answers that I want to get. Well, uh, Lottie was one of 22 families that I had approached to participate in this project. And 13 families came into the project. And after the first couple of months of interviewing, uh, I dropped seven families because there were 11 children in each of two families. And I decided to keep one of the families with 11 children. And Lottie's family was that family I decided to keep. Um, but I decided after the, that interview with her that I would never again interview anyone in the project. And I was determined now to interview everybody in the families, in the six families, the parents and all of the children. There were three families of the six families. There were three families headed by married couples. And there were three families he headed by single women. 
I, would, I decided never again to interview anyone in the project um, about the beginning of their sexual awakening, um, when they became sexually active or when they became um, sexually aware. Um, and I devised a, a methodology that I use today, and I interviewed um, everyone, <clears throat> starting with their school history, relatively neutral area, to get them accustomed to the explicitness of my questions um, and to answering questions because I was interviewing people intensively who had never been interviewed in any intimate detail about their lives before. And starting the interview with their sexuality I thought was um, stepping into a minefield. It's a very sensitive topic at, at any class level in any culture in the world. After we do after we completed the school history, I would do um, growing up in your family, and then after that, growing up in church, and then the fourth interview, growing up outside the family. Um, and um, slowly then, people began to acquire a level of trust with me and how I would use the material that I was gathering and my intention was to get them to take off their public mask, a mask that we all wear, that this is the mask that we want people, the, the mask we wear that we want people to see us um, in a certain way, and it may not be fully the way we are. And by the third and fourth interview, most people began to contradict aspects of what they had already told me. And that's still today, still true today. And the contradictions are very important because that tells you that the person is now beginning to commit more to your project and is willing to tell you some things that are per perhaps uncomplimentary about themselves. Um, and Um, well, what I teach today is that you don't react to the contradiction. You're grateful that the contradiction has appeared, and now you can go into those contradictions and begin to flesh them out. Um, with this, when I started the project on Alice in Childbearing, there were, all of the teenagers lied to me about how they became parents, how the pregnancy had occurred. Um, and on an average, it took them four to six months before they were willing to tell me the truth about consciously seeking to become parents. Number one, becoming a parent changed their status in their community. Took them from the status of adolescent in their eyes to the status of adult. And they would use the expression, I'm grown now. Uh, both the boys and the girls. Now, they were not grown. Many of the um, girls were in very um, uh, intense conflicts with their mother over the, the feeling that on the part of the adolescent mother that she was an adult woman and her mother's attitude that she was still a child. Um, there were a variety of personal reasons why the adolescents became pregnant intentionally. But overall, it was for them what they saw as an arena of achievement. Uh, they saw their lives, number one, they were growing up in one of the poorest sections of, of Washington, D.C. Um, the school system was very, very poor. They understood that they were not competitive in the American job market. And so for them, there was no need to postpone having a child. And a child was, a, for them, a major achievement. It was not, some, you sent, it was not something you sent back after 30 days. Um, and it said a lot about you. It said you were now a woman, from their point of view, or now a man. Um, the boys of the, um, the fathers of the children, um, they were as poorly educated as the mothers of the children and a number of them were very active in the drug trade and at that point were very flush with cash 
particularly the drug crack had not made a big inroad, inroad into this community yet. It did later on, but not while I was doing the study. And the drug of choice in this community was love boat or fencyclidine, also known as PCP. And a lot of them were involved in that drug trade, but for very short periods. Either they were killed or rivals shot them with automatic weapons and their spines were severed and they ended up um, quadriplegics or paraplegics or they went to prison. One girl, um, Sherita Drea, um, after months of interviewing in the fifth month um, of her involvement in the project, finally broke down and told me the truth about why, what was her motivation for becoming a mother at age 15. Um, initially, she had told me that she was ignorant about all aspects of sexuality, that her mother had died of breast cancer when she was 14 without telling her anything about human sexuality. Her boyfriend, William Wheeler, insisted on sex. She complied. She, got, he, she became pregnant and he abandoned her. Um, that was not anywhere close to the truth. Number one, she had had an extensive course in human sexuality and every birth, form of birth control in the 11th grade at nearby Hart Junior High School, at the age, in the seventh grade rather, at the age of 11, um, four years before she became pregnant. She, because of her dark skin complexion, she had a sense of low self-esteem, although she was very pretty. And William Wheeler was light-skinned. And William Wheeler provided her with prestige in the Washington Highlands community. When he began to drift away from her uh, and expressed an interest in dating other girls, it was at that point that Sharita decided to get pregnant. Um, that didn't seem at their relationship. He became anger, angry with her, insisted that she have an abortion, which he was willing to pay for. And um, she refused, and he broke off all relations with her. While she was pregnant, he also was arrested. He was a, a very successful, in that community, a very successful drug dealer. So I was able to go down to the same prison that I had interviewed the Lawrence Smith in 71 and spent several days interviewing him um, about what led up to, I mean, taking him through the whole process of several interviews, trying to open, and opening him, open him up. And uh, there was something going on that um, I didn't recognize while I was interviewing him. We were constantly, and I had done any number of projects and interviewed any number of men and women in prison. But this was the first time where, when I was interviewing Wheeler, we were constantly interrupted by the guards. And I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't want to complain to the administration because I knew the guards would then retaliate. I mean, they would be told not to Keep in, not to interrupt us, but then they would do other things that would make me make my life miserable <laughs> uh, and, and, and feign ignorance about uh, what they were doing. Now I didn't want to get into that tit for tat situation, so I kept my peace. Um, months, months later, when while interviewing Sharita, I asked her had she heard from William, and they were now corresponding. And she said, yes, he's been transferred to maximum security. And maximum security? He's a low-level drug dealer, never has had a violent conviction. Why would they put him in a 23-hour lockup? And she said, well, they caught him with $1,500 cash on his person. And he wasn't supposed to have any, any inmate. He's not supposed to have any amount of money. What I had not seen, and it suddenly dawned on me, William Wheeler was dealing drugs outside of the prison, and the guards were the couriers. And they were interrupting him to get his instructions. And I hadn't picked that up. Um, I say that to say that this is not a person who is dumb. 
but very, very badly undereducated. Um, and in another circumstance would have turned that energy into something a much, much more positive and useful in the society. But he saw this as his only option. And that was for most of the young men that I spent time with, who were the fathers of the children. Those who were working um, at fast food restaurants um, were not earning enough to take care of themselves, much less their children. And so their relationships with the mothers of their children were very bad because they could not f afford to supplement the wel welfare stipend. And most of, almost all of these girls were on welfare. Um, and so the mothers would not let them see their children because they couldn't make a financial contribution. None of them, none of these young men working in these restaurants, or, and the one man worked two, two jobs as a security guard, none of them earned enough to be able to afford to rent on their own a one bedroom apartment in Washington Highlands. Um, and to me that was very, that's, that is very significant. Only the men, only the young men involved in criminal activity were able to make a substantial financial contribution to the welfare of their children. And that was always for a very short period um, before they were either killed or went to prison. Um, at any rate, um, to give you one other example, Sheila Matthews was one of the brightest uh, academically brightest girls in the project. But she got, um, she received no accolades in her community for being bright. And she was clearly, her teachers felt, had the ability to fulfill the dream. She wanted to be a pediatrician and they felt that she had the ability to do that. Um, I met her when she was 15 years old and six months pregnant. And um, she told me in interviews that I had with her over a period of time, that um, she felt that her pregnancy was a sign from God that he loved her. And so I told you I was interviewing entire families. A couple of days later, I was talking to her mother while Sheila was at school. And her mother asked me, what, had Sheila, what did Sheila tell you about why she became pregnant? And I said, well, she said she felt it was a sign from God that he loved her. And her, her, her mother said, Audrey Matthews said, I hope you don't believe that. And I said, well, no, actually I don't, but I'm waiting for her to be candid enough to tell me why she decided to have a child. And she said, well, she, I can tell you why. And this was something that was born out in every family. The mothers knew their daughters well enough to know their daughter's genuine motivation, no matter what the daughter said. They understood what was going on. And she said to me that Sheila had that baby so that she could keep up with her two best girlfriends uh, and two girls that she had been competing against all of her life. Um, and uh, her Mario, the father of the child, was, one of the, was the fellow who worked um, two jobs as a security guard, was not able to financially contribute to his son's PDs welfare the way Sheila wanted him to, and so she would not, their relationship became very acrimonious over the issue of money, and she would not allow him to see, see him. While I was working on this project, I became much more interested in these six, looking at these six, six families into, in the intergenerational aspects of poverty. Almost all of these families were headed by people who had either migrated out of the rural South after World War II, or um, were the children, firstborn children of people who had migrated out of the rural South, sharecroppers really, black sharecroppers. And um, the family of Lillian Williams, she, um, this, she had 11 children. And Lottie, the girl I mentioned earlier, was her sixth born of 11 children. Um, Lillian had migrated to Washington at the age of 15 in 1954 um, and had grown up in Kinston, North Carolina in a sharecropping family. 
She had grown up in her grandparents' house, and she had seen her aunts all have children while she was growing up out of wedlock. Um, and so to her, that was a normal occurrence. Um, when she moved to Washington, she became involved with Charlie Williams, became pregnant with her first child at 15. Her mother insisted on an abortion and uh, aborted the, they, the two of them aborted the baby her, themselves in the house. She became pregnant again and she insisted that she have the child and she and Charlie married. She went on to have five additional children with Charlie and then he left her and moved back to North Carolina. And she had five additional children with three different men. Her explanation for that was that she was running from man to man looking for love that she had never received in her family. And um, she saw children as something of value. Children had been of something of value in her early life because in her sharecropping family, children were an explicit part of the sharecropping agreement, the labor of children. Um, and children were seen by sharecropping families as an economic asset. Transferring um, that into the city though, once the people migrated to the city was um, uh, as a, as a cultural practice became a disaster for many of these people because they had migrated to Washington, a rigidly segregated city um, with farming skills and no way to make it into um, even the working class economy in Washington, DC. <clears throat> so I became very interested in these interconnections with this, the, this second group out of the great migration coming north and facing the problems they had, um, and wanted to tackle a larger subject of the development of the American underclass. My editors said, oh, well, why don't you finish this up and then move to the underclass as your next project. Um, 19, in uh, December 1986, the Urban Institute, after an extensive study of the American underclass, issued a, a um, report on its formation and a definition of what constituted an underclass family. And they determined that 57% of the American underclass at the time in 1990, uh, three million people, was was made up of black Americans, 20% made up of white Americans, and 20% made up of Hispanics. The remaining 3% was made up of um, Asian Americans and Native Americans. So 57%, 20%, 20%, and 3%. For historical reasons of discrimination and social isolation, um, blacks made up the majority of the American underclass. So with that in mind, after the series on adolescent childbearing had been published, I then began looking at um, studying up a project on studying the American underclass or in Washington, D.C., what, what would be the black underclass. Uh, almost no poor people, white people in Washington, D.C. The populations in Washington, D.C. is <clears throat> middle class whites, middle class blacks, and poor blacks. The um, Urban Institute study gave um, the first that I had read definition of what constituted an underclass family. Um, and they broke it down into five parts, the definition. Underclass family was female headed, um, marginally educated, almost no high school graduates in the family. Chronically unemployed, the members were between the ages of 18 and six, 65. And um, welfare dependent, and the fifth part of the definition, um, 
criminal, low-level criminal activity was a major stipend, was a major contribution to the welfare stipend. Uh, and I already knew from previous work that I had done that 50% of the D.C. prison population of 20,000 inmates were made up of criminal recidivists, people who cycle in and out of the prison, um, having completed a sentence on one crime and then being arrested within two years on a fresh crime. And I decided to go into the D.C. jail to look for the underclass families. This is what I thought about initially, the underclass families that I wanted to look at. And I started doing that in, in the summer of 1987, August 1987, going into the jail on a daily basis. Uh, over many months, I interviewed 20 men and 20 women who, who, who met this definition set up by the Urban Institute. And I selected four families that I would follow. I had to postpone the study, however, because going in and out of the jail, um, I became aware that a substantial portion of the guard force was made up of active drug addicts, both addicted to heroin, crack, or both. Um, there were three or four, when I was going in and out of the jail, there were three or four overdoses where they had to take a, a, a guard off his, off his or her security post and rushed them over to D.C. General Hospital. I knew enough about drug addiction to know that they hadn't used drugs at home and then come to work and overdosed. They had immediately gone to an overdose from using drugs on their security post inside the jail. Um, it was something I didn't want to do. It was a story I didn't want to do. But I knew if I told my editors about it, that they would insist that I postpone the underclass study and do that. And they said, and they argued that this is part of what you're doing. You're looking at all aspects of this, of, of people trapped up in this cycle of drug addiction and poverty. Um, most of the offices, it turned out, were actually keeping under lock and key childhood friends and their relatives. It's just that the officers had made it into the guard post or into the D.C. Department of Corrections as employees because they had never been arrested and convicted of felonies. Whereas the men and women that they were keeping locked up, the people they had grown up with, the people that they had started their drug use with, literally, in these in different poor uh, communities in the city of Washington, um, these were all their friends. Um, so it would make sense that they would be trafficking you know, a lot of drugs in and out of the prison, which they were doing, and they were also still, there was no requirement for a urine test, um, so they could go in and out of the prison in their uniform and, um, and uh, unaffected in terms of their employment. So I did that, and um, that ran um, in 1990. And then I turned to the four families that I wanted to follow. And uh, all of them were involved, heavily involved in drug use and drug dealing, again, at a low level, street level. Uh, and it became impossible to follow them. Um, they were all over the place. Once they got out of prison, and either they were high or looking for money to get high and were not interested in sitting down and being interviewed about their family life. <laughs> um, and finally, I settled on one family, the family of Rosalie Cunningham, a woman who had been born in Washington on October 7, 1936. Her parents were, um, and her parents and her grandparents had all been descendants of emancipated slaves on the Bishop and Powell Plantation in 1865. That's when the word reached them that they were free. Uh, and they stayed to work on that same Bishop and Powell plantation uh, for generation after generation as sharecroppers. Denied education, kept isolated, kept as a source of labor in Northampton County, North Carolina, just south of Rich Square on the north bank of the Roanoke River. Uh, very rich cotton growing area, 
particularly when the Roanoke River overflowed every spring. Finally, the owner of the Bishop and Powell Plantation in 1932 lost it to a bank during the Great Depression when prices for cotton and peanut plummeted. Uh, and he told um, uh, Rosalie's uh, parents and grandparents that he would not be able to feed them through the winter, but that he knew somebody who would give them the same kind of sharecropping contract that they operated on on the Bishop and Powell Plantation in Leonardtown, Maryland. Um, and he would help them get there. And so the family moved to Leonardtown, Maryland, and they worked tobacco shares um, for three years and lived off trap muskrat and gathered water, watercress from free-flowing streams. Um, and finally moved into Washington in the fall of 1935. Rosalie was born the following fall. Um, Rosalie attended the segregated school system in Washington, Giddings Elementary School and Randolph Junior High School. And she left Randolph Junior High School, a pregnant teenager, completely unable to read. Nothing learning, dis nothing learning disabled about this woman, but was totally illiterate. Um, how does that happen? You all, uh, people often ask me, you know, how does a child go through six years of elementary school, get to the first, the seventh grade of, rent of junior high school, and you know that she can't do the work? A lot of the men that I've interviewed, men and women, um, will in prison, in prison, will proudly tell you that they didn't drop out of school until the 10th or 11th grade. And always, across the board, when you look at their jacket and when they've been tested, their reading level is between the third and fourth grade. Always. In all the years I've been doing this work and going in and out of in prisons interviewing people, I have found one high school graduate uh, after interviewing scores of men and women in, these, in, the, in the U.S. prisons. Um, and then you ask yourself, well, how does a person reading at a third grade level get to the 11th grade of high school? For the first three years of school, we're learning to read, and then after that, we read to learn. So how are, you even, how are you even able to do seventh grade level work if you're reading at a third grade level when you're in junior high school? Well, the, we know the answer. They're just socially promoted up until the point that the school system is no longer responsible for them. And I found this out in the adolescent childbearing study. All of these kids were listed as dropouts and none of them had dropped out voluntarily. All of them said, when I did the school history, that at some point they were called to the vice principal's office and told, you're too old to any longer be here. You should go to night school or you should find some other venue for your education, but you have to leave here. And then and it was at that point they dropped out. You can imagine, they had no great motivation to drop out. All of these kids qualified for the free breakfast and the free lunch program and the school was the center of their social activity. So when they were told to drop out or leave, they were um, cutting out a, a major part of their social lives. But getting back to Rosalie, she's in the same situation. Um, illiterate, pregnant at 13, has a child at 14. Unfortunately, she began um, because her parents were very poor, her mother worked as a domestic, her father worked as a cement finisher. Um, she interpreted their inability to provide things for her, clothing and so on, as denial of, of decent clothes, because her mother always went shopping at the Salvation Army or Goodwill. And Rosalie wanted to dress fashionably. So she began shoplifting at age 13. She got her first juvenile sentence at age 13, 19 days um, 
in a juvenile facility. It never stopped her. It didn't phase her at all. It just became a part of her life, something that she felt she had to uh, go through. I was called jailing. That's what the term she used, and that was fine with her. Um, by, she married the, she had two children, and then married the father of her third child because her mother threatened to have him put in jail, um, Albert Cunningham. And, they, um, and she named her son, her third-born son, Alvin. Um, that marriage didn't last very long. She was 16, and he beat her regularly. And he beat her so badly once while she was six months pregnant, and she walked back to her mother's house about two miles. And her mother didn't recognize her coming through the door. Her face was so swollen. So she told her, you don't have to go back to that man. And she never did. But she then went on to have um, five additional children with three separate men. Um, and then eventually moved into, after she had her eighth child, um, she decided to have her, um, a tubula, uh, her, her the expression she used, her tubes tied, so she couldn't have any more children because the children were coming too fast. She was on welfare, and she was working off the books at a place called the Cocoa Club in, in Northeast Washington. And a drug dealer, while she was working there, serving beer at the tables, drug dealer, heroin dealer, approached her about selling heroin. And she would get uh, a dollar, no, she would get 25 cents off of um, every dollar of heroin she sold. And she sold them in 25 cent capsules for people who snorted heroin. Um, and that was her introduction to drug dealing. Uh, pretty soon she was into prostitution, taking customers home from the bar. And she continued to shoplift on a regular basis. Um, and that became her lifestyle. She got into a relationship, a lesbian relationship, when she was in her 30s. Um, and the, the younger woman ended the relationship just before Rosalie's 36th birthday. And her daughter, who by that time was a heroin addict, her oldest daughter, who was 16, told her mother to, she was giving a party for her mother, and her mother was in all this emotional pain, so she suggested her mother take a hit of heroin to get over her emotional pain. And so Rosalie's addiction began very late in life for most people. Most people start their drug addiction in adolescence, but she began as a 36-year-old woman and really enjoyed it. It took away the pain of the ended relationship and um, she liked it mixed, she liked her heroin mixed with cocaine called a speedball. Um, and, and that continued to be her life for almost all of her life. Um, I met her at, when she was 51 years old in the DC jail. She had been arrested in the fall of 1987, selling heroin at the corner of 14th and W Streets in Washington, D.C., to earn enough money to feed her three youngest grandchildren, because their mother was in jail on a crack cocaine charge. Um, she, she was an active heroin addict at the point, and when she was arrested, the D.C. jail, they, they don't give you any drugs to help you come off your addiction. It's cold turkey. And she thought that this time, in the fall of 1987, she would die. But she, she lived through it, and she approached the man who was working with me, a man named Francis Henderson, classification and parole officer in the DC jail, who, uh, and told him that she wanted to tell him her life story. And he said, Rosalie, I have 200 men and women on my caseload. I don't have time to listen to your life story but I know just the man I'm gonna put you with. <laughs> and so he introduced the two of us in January of 1988, and I spent nine days in the female cell block um, interviewing her, taking her through school history, family history, her history in church, of which there was quite a bit, in Baptist church, and growing up outside the family. 
And at the end of it, I knew this had to be one of the people I would follow. Because her youngest sister was in the adjoining cell block. And her mother had had 22 children, of whom 11 had reached adulthood. Um, and Rosalie told me in great detail how six of her eight children were active drug addicts and criminal recidivists. Over the course of the next four years, I interviewed her intensely, and we visited every place she had ever lived in Washington uh, to really um, jog her memory about different events in her life. And there were 18 places, two of them in homeless shelters. And uh, I met all of, I met, of course, I met and interviewed all of her children. And the best time for me to meet and introduce myself to her children was when they were in jail. And they went in and out of jail on a regular basis. Because when they were on the street, they were either high on drugs or running money or involved in some scam or something that would get me arrested if I was with them <laughs> uh, to get money, to get drugs. Um, in fact, Rosalie and I fell out a couple of times because we, I had tried to work out an agreement with her that she would not get involved in any criminal activity when I was with her. And she would ignore that and get in all kinds of illegal activity when I was with her. But I began to pick up, pick up when that was coming and this would move away. One time she had me sitting outside, very cold morning, sitting outside of a store waiting for her to pick up some groceries. And it was taking too long. So I got out of the car and went inside and found she was shoplifting. I said, oh Lord, that's the last time I wait for you outside of the store. <laughs> and at those points, she would always threaten to go upside my head. But she never, she did once, she did once. But, um, but it became very clear that all of her children had been infected by her lifestyle. And they were, and they still do, they're still in the same lifestyle today. Her oldest son, however, is dead. Um, but the other five children, um, three, three men, two women, are cy cycle in and out of the prison system on a regular basis. I want to tell you um, about two, oh, I have spoken too long. I wanted to tell you about two of her sons very briefly, Alvin and Eric, neither of whom has ever been involved in drugs and never gone to jail. And it's my relationship with them that helps me keep up with everything, all the rest of the family. Rosalie died of AIDS-related pneumonia on July 7, 1995. But Alvin, the oldest of the, her third born son, uh, the oldest of the two, Alvin, um, very early in life, he became very quiet and introverted. And, and in the housing project that they lived in, at the public housing project they lived in at the time, um, at the Richardson Elementary School in the third grade, he began gravitating to the kids who were relatively middle class. And of course, this is in the period of very definite ethnic, ethnic segregation. Um, so you had all classes of black people living in one section of the city, and this was Northeast Washington, off East Capitol Street. And so you had middle class, working class, poor people, or the children of, of all classes going to this one elementary school. And Alvin gra gravitated toward the middle class kids and would, would visit them in their homes. And uh, he noticed very early on that the lifestyle there was very different than the lifestyle that he lived in. And it was something that he wanted to acquire. Number one, his friends had their own bedroom. Um, when he was invited to stay and have dinner or lunch with the family, the television was turned off and everyone sat around a dining room table and used flatware to eat with. Uh, and this was something that he said that he wanted as a young child to be able to do. Um, in the seventh grade at Evans Junior High School, he met a teacher, Gartrell Franklin, a man he called Mr. Frank. And Gartrell emphasized to Alvin um, such things as getting an education, staying off drugs, no drug use, and no drug sales. 
And Alvin latched on to Gottrell Franklin because he was looking for someone who could show him a way out of this situation. Now, when I interviewed Gottrell Franklin, I said, well, you, you, know, you played a significant role as a mentor in this young man's life because he, at that point, had mentored Alvin for 20 years. And, um, and he said, yeah, but it was not something I had, had intended to do. Look, I had just graduated from college, Howard University. I had student loans to repay. This was my first job. I had a red Corvette convertible, and I was planning to party. And Alvin wouldn't let me. Alvin found out where he lived and would show up at his house every weekend. Right. Um, and with, um, with Gottrell as his mentor and the emphasis that Gottrell gave him, Alvin lives a very middle class life in Washington today, he and his wife and stepdaughter. Um, he worked for the Metro bus system, or well, he was when I met him, he was a bus driver, then he became supervisor of the Metro subway system, one of the stations. Eric, Rosalie's fifth born son, um, had an aversion to his mother's lifestyle in terms of the shoplifting. Well, he had aversion to all parts of his mother's lifestyle, to be candid, but when he was on uh, the same age as Alvin now, the family had moved into a different part of Washington and he was attending Goding Elementary School. And the children there began to tease Eric about his mother being a thief. Now, these children knew that, that Rosalie was a shoplifter, because the parents of these children bought hot goods from Rosalie. And when, Rose, when Rosalie only shoplift for quality material, and she would leave the price tags on the items that she had shoplift, and then charge her customers one-third the retail price. Um, and you, Eric was, Eric is still today, a very tough street fighter. And you generally, even if you were bigger than him, you only teased him about his mother once. Because even if you, when you got into the fight, even if you won, <laughs> you didn't want to fight him again. And if he didn't think he could take you on, he'd run up behind you and hit you in the back with a brick and then run. So you don't want to be look, looking over your shoulder the rest of the school year. So you teased Eric once about his mother being a thief. But in, in this process, as, a, as a, a young boy, eight or nine, he confronted Rosalie in the house and said, look, you know, people are talk, talking about you at school and to say you're stealing stuff. And I don't understand why you have to steal stuff. You get a check for us. Why do you have to steal? And Rosalie wasn't accustomed um, to engaging in this kind of dialogue with her children, but she decided to respond to him. They both agreed. And she told him very emphatically, I shoplift clothes for all eight of you. And everything you are wearing at the moment is something that I have shoplifted or boosted. She used the term boosted, something that I have boosted for you. And I shoplift for each of you by size. Because the welfare check I get is not enough to feed and clothe all of you for 30 days. And now get out of my face. And he knew the back of her hand across his face would follow. So he got out of her face. But it never settled for him. It never settled right for him. Um, Eric, seventh grade again, Evans, same high school, Evans Junior High School, is hooking school one day at home. Uh, Rosalie was not big on her children going to school. So any excuse they gave her to get out of school was acceptable. And Nancy McAllister came in, social worker, and she asked him why was he at home. And he gave her some flimsy excuse, and she grabbed him physically and pushed him out the door and told him to get to school. Um, and that afternoon, Eric showed up at her office. Now, her office was right across the street from Evans Junior High School at Shad Elementary School. What was Eric looking for? The same thing Alvin had been looking for, someone to show him a way out. And Nancy had just been divorced. She had just been through an ugly divorce with her husband, had three children to raise as a single mother. She was not looking to take on any mentoring role. Eric would not let her go. 
So she began first reluctantly and then got involved with Eric, giving him books to read. When he came to the point that he could trust her, he explained to her he could not read. Now, here we are again. Seventh grade, cannot read at all. She said, well, that's impossible. So she felt, how do you get to the seventh grade and you can't read? So she felt he was learning disabled and it had never been um, tested by the school system. So she sent him downtown to be tested. Three days later, she got a reply from the testers. They said, no, there's nothing wrong with him. He's not learning disabled. In fact, he's very bright. And she said, well, he can't read. They said, well, there are many children like that who can't read. He's never been taught to read. He had, you remember I told you, I had been to every part of Washington, had Rosalie lived in all of her life, 18 places, always in a pocket of poverty, always served by poor, badly run public schools. Not in the middle class sections of Washington, which, uh, which, which the school, where the schools are generally very good, but not in the poor sections of Washington. Public school system is very, very bad. So she, out of her own money, began paying for tutors and put him into a reading program. And as a result, Eric is semi-literate today. But he literally attached himself to Nancy McAllister until she retired <laughs> and moved to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. She claims she didn't do that to get away from Eric. <laughs> I had to go down there to see her, to interview her about her relationship with Eric. Um, but that's part of the story of the underclass. It's an ongoing story. Uh, it's continuing today. I think Hurricane Katrina blew the cover off a substantial portion of the underclass in New Orleans. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop. I can go on and on and on. And I agree to answer some questions, if any of you have any questions. Thank you very much. There are microphones here if you want to ask any questions on either side in the aisle. Masumi, you don't have a question? No? <laughs> Diane, you don't have a question? <laughs> various situations that you've described where you were encountering um, people who um, might engage in um, threats to you. Um, and people threatening me? People threatening me? Possibly. Yeah. Or situations where uh, if you were walking in as an outsider um, and you were learning the space, the territory, and I guess you could add this to, to whether you were in southeast Washington, which is where I grew up, or uh, in um, Angola. How do, you, how do you learn to do that? I don't know. I, um, I guess just being open and honest with people. I, you know, did you ever want to hear the question? How do you go into threatening situations, southeast Washington being one, Angola being another? Well, I was traveling with the guerrillas in Angola. So um, if I had been caught by their opposition, you know, I would have been in pretty bad shape, I would imagine. But I wasn't. But um, I don't know, in terms of moving around and engaging people, being honest and open, non-judgmental about what they're doing, um, and that reflects in myself professionally, and I think that's my attitude personally. So um, with some luck, that has managed to get me through some very tight situations, yeah. Yes. Is that the great Sundiata Chajua? No, this is the humble <laughs> Sundiata Chajua speaking to the great Leon Dash. Uh, <laughs> uh, Leon, it seems to me that the multi-system institution that uh, comes up in 
in your narrative is the failure of the educational system. It is and I was wondering, pervasive. kind of, two part question. One, how do you think the trajectory of the Bush administration in pushing charter schools and general privatization will, in fact, affect children's learning? And two, what would be your general idea about how we can, in fact, uh, transform the public schools into institutions that would, in fact, educate children? One, I don't yet have a conclusive opinion on, on vouchers and privatization of the school systems and, and any number of efforts. Um, I think, overall, the measure of charter schools, overall, they have been considered a failure. Um, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, two, um, my own thoughts about reforming the existing public education system is that they won't be reformed until you're able to change the political will. Uh, and I don't see that the political will exists. Most school systems are run on the collection of property taxes of a great part of the school systems. And of course, the middle class contribute the, uh, the lion's share of those property taxes to the running of a local school system. And I don't see whatever ethnic group, if they're middle class, um, shifting resources and hiring quality teachers and reducing class sizes in poor communities, whether they uh, impact poor rural whites in Appalachia, uh, rural or urban Hispanics in Southwest US, or the urban slums where so many of the generations of migrants, black migrants out of the rural South have been now caught in a cycle of intergenerational poverty. Um, Unless there, now there's a, there, unless there is a significant social movement to begin to rectify um, what has been going on for many, many years, um, I don't see it happening in the near future. And it's, and it's, it's badly needed. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say that before earlier, you said that uh, William Wheeler uh, tried to end his tried to end his girlfriend's pregnancy, and many other, many other men you talked about said that you know, they would want their girlfriend to have an abortion. And then you talked about an, another man who said that, you know, I mean, in order for him to reinforce his masculinity, in order for him to reinforce his manhood, he wanted his girlfriend to have a child and to have the possibility of having a child, which is the prevalent way that men deal with children, abortion, pregnancy, and manhood. Well, I don't know. I found, I found in some families that I looked at, and over the course of all doing all of this work, some families have a very definitive prohibition against any form of abortion from the moment of conception. A child is a child from the moment of conception. Um, and in other families, that's not the case. It, as long as the abortion is done during a safe period, maybe the first trimester, they find it acceptable. There was something else. In the adolescent childbearing study, uh, there were a group of kids at this high school called, this called Baloo High School uh, who were derided, derisively referred to as brainiacs. And they were in the advanced placement classes. Uh, and they were a very small group. And they were as sexually active as the kids that I followed who were um, not doing well in school at all. And um, if there were pregnancies among the brainiacs, the pregnancies were aborted. Um, why? My conclusion was because they saw that they had a post-secondary future, whereas the kids that I followed knew that they did not. So you, you, I don't know that there's a prevailing attitude. There's a range of attitude, and it's usually black or white. I accept abortion when, during the safe period, no, abortion is um, unacceptable from the moment of conception. And I, those were the two views in the families that I followed. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>